Good afternoon and welcome to the broadcast of the Enid City Commission Study Session Meeting. Broadcasting live in high definition from the lower level conference room at the City Administration Building located at 401 West Owen K. Garriott. Please stay tuned as Mayor Bill Shuey presides over the meeting. Tell the people that are watching at home that uh, that Bill Shuey is uh, out of town on uh, on business tonight, and uh, my name is Ron Jansen. I'm the designated mayor pro tem for this particular period of time, so I'll be conducting the meeting tonight. Uh, I look around the table, and uh, of course the mayor's gone, and Commissioner Wilson, I understand, is not going to be. She wasn't here. feeling well. She okay, said she had she's, a migraine. She's not feeling well. So. But all of the other commissioners are here and uh, we'll call the meeting to order. The uh, item number two is that the commissioners request discuss any item of concern on the regular session agenda for June the 21st. Anyone have any items they're concerned about? I have a couple. All righty. I'll take the wrong spot. Proceed. 9-11. Um, Explain the water line. Stone, 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 Ridge. Stone Bridge water line. Oh, Chris, you want to take that one? We're accepting a permit. Oh, just 9 9 11. Yes, this is acceptance of a permit of a um, water line uh, extension at Stone Bridge. And this is, I'll show you where it's at on our um, list of consent items on the map here. Again, 11 set the DEQ permit in Stonebridge. Stonebridge is in this location just north of Cleveland, no, just north of Chestnut and west of Cleveland. And we'll go to that item, have a better view of it. Again, this is a location map. Uh, this is Cleveland, or this is Cleveland to the north off here, and this is Chestnut on the south. The water line is shown in red at this location. The water line was extended in here as part of uh, uh, the development of the uh, Walmart market. Uh, there is a um, residential development over here. The water line has actually been extended over here, and this is just a formally accepting the permit for the, from ODEQ for the construction uh, of the water line uh, extending from uh, uh, the, original, the construction site here over to uh, the residential site. Was this the one we visited with about a few months ago that went from large pipe to small pipe to large That pipe? was a sanitary sewer uh, line, but it was in the same location. That's correct. It was in the same location, but that was a sanitary sewer system. And this is, uh, which, and this is a water line that is being put through here. And basically, basically, the water line comes through and, and will connect to the water line in the residential uh, eventually, so we'll have a loop system through here. Okay, that was planned from the... Get go then? Yes, it was planned and planted from the beginning. Okay, and while you're up there, 912? <clears throat> yes, uh, 912, I which is. What he was doing out there. We're just closing out the, uh, the financials on uh, uh, some open requ uh, requisitions. Uh, 912 is with the contract with Jacob Engineering, which did the water reclamation facility. That project was uh, completed and been accepted. And this action would basically close the uh, the contract uh, with them and deduct uh, uh, the remainder amount we had to them. They were under contract 
for designing that project uh, based on, uh, uh, they had a set fee based on certain improvements. Um, and we, we actually were able to close that engineering contract with some savings on engineering fees and it just writes off the requisition. So you're basically finished with it? You just Yes, well, yes, we've been the, finished. The box that was drawn up in the picture looked like he was getting ready to do something else. That's what I didn't understand. Okay, let's go to the top. This, this box here is just a location of uh, the area that they had under design. They designed the waste water reclamation facility and the connection to the existing plant for the sludge lines. That was in their design, uh, and that design was about uh, about million nine, as I recall, uh, for the uh, for design and put together and the management design, control, and management of the project. Uh, we cleared that project. We were able to save some money in the management side, and this this writes off the uh, uh, the savings. Okay. I just thought you were getting ready to do something else. I didn't understand. Why yeah, we have about twenty four thousand nine ninety eight savings, and it's just this just closes the contract, and uh, we'll uh, close out that requisition and and uh, return those funds to the general to the general fund budget. Thank you. That's all I have, Ron. Anyone else have any items they want to talk about on the agenda tonight? We're on 9.1. Um, I've had the, the um, opportunity to visit with Bob Berry on 9.1. He had some ideas on cost savings. Gerald, were those pursued in this project? Or, uh, yes, they were pursued. And, and what happened was we were having some difficulties getting the property that we needed. So we went back and designed it this way, but I've had a meeting with him just recently, and um, we talked about coming back with a change order. And so I didn't get a chance to talk to him this afternoon. I saw an email that he sent about 3 o'clock. I don't know if he sent it to you guys, but I feel good about our, our meeting that we had and working with him to improve this project. But our intent is to do that through change order one that we'll be bringing as soon as we can get that property. I have property. not seen an email from him, but it sounded like he had some good ideas for some cost savings. He, he does have some good ideas, and there are ideas that we originally wanted to work on, and we just weren't able to work it out, but I think we're going to be able to work it out now. Okay. Um, the channel that we're talking about building in Oakwood West, um, what we would do is connect it to his South Railroad embankment channel, and, and uh, so yes, I think we're all excited about the opportunity to, to do that. that included him donating some land for yes. the purpose of the city for free Is yes that he's talking about easements yes yeah, uh, so so would it make sense to hold off on approving this contract until those <clears throat> discussions have been had i don't think so because um I mean, unless maybe he misunderstood me I mean, we talked about i thought we were ready to go we would approve this and we'll come back with a change order it's going to take a certain amount of days you want to speak to how many days before we can even get started anyway yeah it normally takes us 30 to 45 days to process all the contract document as these numbers, this bid was received a uh, little more than four or five weeks ago. If we delay, those bids no longer are valid because they exceed the time limit. Okay. So long as everybody's on the same page, and I want to make sure that we pursue all options to save cost. And it sounded like it could be a pretty big number. I think. You know, yes. I remember him talking about 100 plus. Uh, we customers. fully intend to come back with the change order as soon as we can get it worked out to this project. Um, and then also, Bob talks a lot about Chestnut, uh, or not Chestnut, Cherokee, Cherokee detention. detention. And and we're gonna dig. We're gonna come back to you and talk about that too. We have in the budget to acquire property, but it makes sense for us to dig on the detention that we have behind the Honda place right now. And okay. so, those are the things we talked about <coughs> in the meeting we just had two and, weeks and ago. Yes, and on the Cherokee detention, since we've had several people in there digging, what we'll have to do is we'll have to go back and resurvey, refresh the design, and then award a contract to dig. So it's not something that I can turn overnight, but we have we have a fair amount of money in the budget for next year to do that, and we'll just work that process. Thank you. Appreciate it. Thanks, Chris. Anything else? I had uh, a couple of items on the consent agenda that I had a question about. Item 9.3. Uh, the landscaping on Rolling Oaks. I was just kind of curious about what all we were going to do, and perhaps Robert can fill us in on that. Said the we're going to have going to spend three thousand three hundred and twenty-five dollars seeding, fifteen hundred and sixty-six dollars sodding, and six thousand eighty-five dollars on shrubs. And and this is something that they described in the uh, in the agenda item as to keep the 
headlights from hitting the front of somebody's house? Yes, Commissioner. Let me. Um, just, that is a change order. The uh, the, the uh, first items are the items for. Uh, we had uh, adjustment quantities because we uh, exceeded uh, uh, the seeding. We had a little more acreage than we originally estimated, and we had more <coughs> drainage flume. But we also, in the project, are, I'm going to, again, this is uh, uh, the uh, Rolling Oaks Ditch Facility in its entirety shown here. The work, and, and on this drawing, you can see Cleveland at the bottom and Rolling Oaks Drive on, on the right and north is to my right. And this is the area that was actually under construction and I'm highlighting the north end. Um, this is another view of the project showing the, uh, the layout for the construction where we were, we excavated and built the detention. The north end is shown, but outlined here. And contour, this space is a flat area, which is fairly complete. We also relocated uh, Rolling Oaks Drive uh, as shown on this map in the corner see that it was close to the railroad we moved it away from the railroad so we have traffic that's coming back and basically uh, coming into a resident uh, on Rolling Oaks Drive at the location shown on my map where we've highlighted uh, an area uh, that um, was a concern that property owner we've worked a arrangement to come in and put a we're putting about uh, 10 uh, uh, small trees uh, along here to provide uh, or actually there are tree bushes provide about uh, an eight foot height, provide some uh, barrier and landscaping to uh, protect from the uh, additional movement of, of headlights because of the relocation of the road. Robert, and isn't that a church? No, the church is just, uh, you are correct, the church is just to the, um, the east. east of the site. The church, uh, if I can show you, is just right in this area. And right at this curve, when this curve comes around, the property owner, the property is, is right at the end of the, and the radius. So the church is fairly well protected uh, because uh, these lighting would basically go right into the uh, window of the residence. The church is just off that. So you're, you're talking about talk about, about putting thousand dollars a shrub. Yeah, just just under that. I think yeah, we're we're about ten we're about ten shrubs in there. Yes, sir. And it includes the installation and the three-year maintenance program. But yes, sir. These seems are all, seems awfully high. The, yeah, and these are these are up. These would be about uh, uh, six foot. Uh, these are a little bit mature, about six foot uh, uh, trees, and they'll grow to about ten feet. So we have <coughs> put a little bit more trees. These we're not putting the uh, younger ones. These are a little bit more trees we're putting in here to get that protection. Do you, do you now, get those locally, or do we have somebody ship those in from overseas? <laughs> Well, we acquire those through our general contractor. We're providing those through his through his vendor. His source. Is this the same person that brings their horse remains across the road? No. <laughs> I, I don't know. It did just seem like an awful lot of money for a rather, it sounds like a fairly small project. Uh, item item 9.5, uh, the Metal Lake Concession Building. I, is is our concession in operation there yet, Gerald? Have yes, got, it is. Have we got a concession there on hand? Yes, it is. There's a gentleman named Deacon Jones the city has contracted with. He is, uh, I was out there Saturday myself, and I bought a, a can, or I bought some popcorn and a Coke from him. He's okay. selling prepackaged type stuff at this point. And he is also working to get his piers done to put his dock out there so he can rent out the, um, the paddle mm -hmm. boats and the kayaks the city's also contracted with him to do. Is he, uh, what, is he open, uh, what, the same hours that the rides are? Is that the I think situation? he is right now. Contractually, he's going to be open longer. Um, but I think right now he's waiting to get his docks and his boats going. Uh, but I do know that he's out there at least on Thursdays to Sundays. And I'll have to verify with him if he's out okay. there. But ultimately, he's supposed to be out there every day but Mondays. Okay. Uh, one, one other item was 9.7. Uh, this is something I've, I've, we see it every year, the sewer inspection uh, with the video sewer inspection. Uh, what, how many sewers do we review every year? Is this something, I, I'm assuming we're not doing all of them, so do we have, have a certain schedule that we do, a certain number of them every year? We typically try... Uh, we try to do about uh, 10 percent. I think we have a requirement to video um, uh, to inspect our sewer system uh, over a 10-year period to uh, fully inspect the uh, system. And that's part of the uh, requirement for the Department of Environmental Quality. And that's why one of the reasons we maintain this program. Uh, 
So this uh, and this program will cover. Uh, go to the next slide. No. We'll cover the areas outlined in red, which substantial part of the, uh, of the city we're trying to catch up on. And you can see Randolph Street in the center, uh, Garland on the west, and there is Cleveland. We'll go just past Cleveland to, to the east. So it's uh, we try to do about 10% of the sewer system in the city, so we cover that in a 10 year period, we've covered the system. Do, do we contract this out? Yes, the, to do this, uh, this uh, amount of work, and, and this is, again, the, first I'm gonna show you, the, this is the area, the next slide shows you the sanitary sewers that are, that are in that area, the amount of footage that we're uh, dealing with, and I think uh, operations does have a uh, video inspection system, but they keep that pretty well busy due on maintenance issues. And to accomplish this task, we, uh, we do contract out to service. And it takes probably <coughs> continuous service about, about six to eight months of continuous service to complete this work. <coughs> do they find quite a few things for us to repair? Yes, they do. do they? Yeah, we find, yes, we find, uh, um, we'll find uh, P1, priority one point repairs. Uh, we have about uh, 200 of them now on the waiting list for uh, point repairs. And, you know, recently you approved, uh, I think, a contract for point repairs, and those are identified by the sanitary system. They inspect, this, they inspect these systems. Oops. Hang on. That didn't do it. They inspect, they inspect these uh, systems, uh, the sanitary system from manhole to manhole, and identify uh, where we have, uh, they identify where we have connections, wide connections, which is very valid for future use. But basically they identify where we have cracks in line, offset joints, or where the, uh, where a lot of root, root intrusion and helps identify where we go do our maintenance program. Then we come back and do the point repair program set up to go in and make, make those repairs. Whether it's point repair, go in and dig up the uh, sewer line and make, and, and patch it back, repair the wires, put the pipe back in place. Or in some cases where it's feasible to go in and, and slip line the line and put a slip liner and, and replace the line with a line system. We have 30 to 40 point repairs, I think, in the last contract. Um, for this, unfortunately, we'll probably double or triple the, the, the need for repairs will probably come out of this video inspection. And then we'll try to schedule those over the next year's to uh, bring those, um, to make those repairs. Okay, any, anybody else got any questions for on the agenda this evening? Before we move on to item number three. Uh, item number three on our study session agenda is to discuss stop loss insurance plan. You want to introduce to <coughs> Good evening, Mayor, Commissioner, City Manager. Um, last week, we had the last commission meeting, we had the stop loss proposal on the consent agenda, and it was tabled. So we have brought in our benefit consultants to visit with you this evening about any questions that you have about the stop loss um, insurance. This is Jared Willis with Holmes Murphy, and he'll walk you through the process and answer any questions you have. Perfect. Thank you. Um, what we've done is we prepared just a quick PowerPoint presentation to walk through what some of the um, responses were. In, in short, on an annual basis, you guys secure stop loss to help protect again in, against individual and aggregate stop loss. Um, in today's world, in essence, if a claim exceeds $150,000, you purchase individual stop loss to help protect against that risk above that. Um, if the plan as a whole, all the claims from all the members throughout the course of the year exceed a certain threshold, you buy what they call aggregate insurance to help protect against that risk, and that's fairly standard practice. It's not required. You don't have to buy stop loss insurance, but typically in today's world when you're dealing with, you know, the potential of, you know, million, two million, three million dollar claims, it's nice to have some protection, and most employers of your size purchase um, stop loss. So what I did is I just prepared a quick um, PowerPoint presentation to walk you through what some of those uh, responses look like we had I think 10 different vendors respond with various options some said I'll match what you have today others said would you be willing to take on a little bit more risk for a little bit less premium um, I think the combination of all the various options came up to about 24 or so so what I'll what I'll have in the presentation is kind of a condensed version of that I believe in your packets have the more detailed of, of all the other options that were um, on the table for review and consideration you can flip to the next slide 
Uh, this is just a quick snapshot that just talks about what you currently do. I think I already touched on bullet number one. Currently, you purchase stop loss through a third party. Um, what that basically means is your insurance is purchased from Blue, you know, from Blue Cross Blue Shield or from the insurance carrier. Um, however, there's a third party out there that's willing to take on risk. Um, they say, you know, pay me a premium and I'll take those claims just like Blue Cross would. There is a, um, a communication component that occurs, which happens, you know, Blue Cross processes claims. They send those reports over to the third party vendor. The third party vendor analyzes that risk, says, yep, I think this is a, this is a reasonable reimbursement. Subsequently, they would reimburse the city for those claims that exceeded either individual or aggregate stop loss. So there's a little bit of a delay in that process. Um, currently, they pay, currently, you pay about $250,000 in stop loss premiums. Um, reimbursements, you had two large claimants um, this year. Uh, when you add up the reimbursements above the $150,000 threshold, that came into about $274,000, which means for every dollar you paid the insurance company, they didn't make a dime. Matter of fact, they lost about $20,000, about $19,000, $20,000. Um, individual stop loss is currently set at one fifty, dollars and aggregate is set at one twenty five. dollars What that basically means is if you just expect claims to be a dollar for the year, um, typically, stop loss carriers will say, look, if claims go 5% above or 7% above, you probably don't want to pay a third party to protect against that risk. But if we really have a bad year, a five-year or a 10-year flood is what they call it in the, in, the, um, in the industry, if you just have a bad year um, and claims get really, really high, once it reaches 25% above that expected level, we would like some protection. And that's what you currently purchase today. Next slide, please. So we went out, uh, we analyzed the marketplace, we narrowed it down to finalists. Um, really focused on three primary areas, but really looking some, for some feedback uh, from you as well. But really, fixed costs are always an important item. That's what hits your budgeted line item. Uh, what you don't see, well, I guess you do see it when you when you look at annual projected claims. Is you know whenever you when you increase your liability, there's the possibility that claims may occur that you have to pay for. So we're interested in in the fixed cost. We're interested in at what point stop loss carriers um, start kicking in, and we're also concerned about lasers. Lasers basically just mean if you um, if I was a third party wanting to insure the risk of the city, it would basically say, this person over here, we know they're going to be a million dollars. I don't know that I feel comfortable with that. Can we pull that person off to the side and maybe underwrite them a little bit differently? But for the rest of the group, we'll leave everything else normal. And so we didn't want that. We wanted basically insurance is about pooling risk and spreading risk, and so we wanted to make sure that that was included in the proposal responses as well. Um, so the three vendors that were identified as finalists matching current terms, uh, we'll get to those in just a second. Um, yeah, flip to the next slide, please. We'll just hop into it. Okay, so lots of lots of words down the left-hand side, lots of numbers on the page, but I'll just draw your attention to the ones that probably would jump out at you the easiest. This grayed-out column right here is Enforce. If you want to look at what you pay in annualized premiums, it's currently $253,000 in premium. Um, that provides comprehensive coverage. The 2412 is just a vernacular of incurred claims, in claims that were incurred in the last 24 months but paid in the most recent 12. That's a comprehensive contract for a mature plan like yours, so we match those benefits. We wanted to make sure that mo both pharmacy and medical were included. We match those across the board as well. Um, individual stop loss, so any one claimant in a given 12-month period of time, if they reach you know, 175000 200 a million dollars, when it, at $150,000, that's the city's responsibility. The claims above that become the responsibility of the stop loss carrier. So we match that as well. They break these out into specific rates, aggregate rates, which is that kind of overarching plan protection. Um, they kind of set what they think those targets need to be, and then you come up with premium. So in essence, what your current arrangement is, is 253000 for matching those enforced terms, the three that, that most comparably matched, you know, not only your, your contract, um, but were the lowest in premiums were BCBS is Blue Cross Blue Shield, uh, BC, BCS is a third party carrier as is Transamerica, both at higher rates at $474,000 and $337,000 respectively. There were other $150,000 stop loss quotes that were not what we call firm and final. Uh, firm and final basically means, as I stand here before you today, if you said, yes, we want to go with that, we just give the, you know, once you ratify that, the contract carrier says, everything I propose to you is good. If it's not firm and final, what that basically means is saying, here are illustrative numbers, but until you give me more claims data, more case notes on the individual that has ongoing conditions, 
at that point in time, I may or may not hold firm with my rates. So what you see here before you are firm and final rates. So of those, as you can see, Blue Cross Blue Shield is the cheapest. Next slide, please. Um, on, I'm sorry, was there a question? Yeah, go, go back. Yeah, yeah. Can you go back, please? I don't really understand what you're saying. Huh? Um, so this other, okay, so Blue Cross Blue Shield, we're just comparing these last three. Yeah, so this, this is what you currently spend today, the 253000 And so when we looked at renewal options and said, okay, for matching our contract, what would be the premiums associated with that? Okay. And each of them increased, obviously, okay. and the 327 matching current benefit or current contract was the cheapest of those that came back in. Okay. And just to clarify, that was the cheapest looking at that deductible level. That's exactly right. $1,000. Okay. Yeah, so, so and, and to that, no lasers, right? Yeah, so no lasers in here. This is for the entire plan. Um, you know, all, you know, every single one of your employees, you know, nobody's excluded. Yeah, like Insurance 101, I mean, it's about how much risk you want to take on. So if you go back one slide, please. You know, so this $150,000 individual stop loss deductible is highly negotiable. It's actually, matter of fact, it's dictated and mandated. I mean, you guys just get to pick what that is. If you said, hey, you know what? I would like this number to be 175 or 200,000, and we're going to get to those in just a second. You can pay lower premiums; you just take on more risk associated with each claimant that potentially comes through the pipeline. Your over the last four years, just to give you a quick, you know, kind of a, some relativity, for each of the last four years, you've had a claimant in excess of 200,000 dollars. So you're always hitting the 150 and then above. There was nobody less than that, and in the current year, you have two individuals. Um, one that's in the you know, the mid two hundred thousand, and one that's in excess of three hundred thousand. So each of those is generating those stop loss reimbursements for us. But you could obviously say, I want to take on more of that front side risk and pay a little bit less premium. You're just gambling a little bit. So, and for a group of your size, you would anticipate on average about one and a half to two large claimants <coughs> per year for a group of your size. So, large claimant being the ones that we just talked about. Next slide, please. So this is just an illustration. Matter of fact, we'll come on this side because this is where the, where the verbiage is. So if you think in terms of from an illustrative perspective, Blue Cross Blue Shield offered an alternative quote. They said, well, if you want to take on a little more risk at 165000 that would mean that the city takes on the difference between 165 and 150 for each of the large claimants. So if you had a $200,000 claimant, and under this contract, stop loss would reimburse $50,000. Obviously, under this one, it'd be thirty-five thousand dollars. Could, could, could you go back over there again? I oh. understand what you're trying to do, but the people that are watching this on television are not going to be able to hear oh, you. Sorry, got it. Makes sense. So, in there, that's this is just an alternative quote, and as you can tell, they actually came in at a little bit higher premium. You said, "I said, well, wait a minute. You just got done telling me that I get lower premium if I take on more risk." They underwrite these things where they think they would like the contract to fall, and that basically just tells us under the Blue Cross Blue Shield arrangement, and they were the only carrier that quoted that way, they don't really want to write a 165 contract. So they just inflate the premiums. If you buy it, great. They win compared to the old contract, but all things being equal. But isn't, shouldn't we compare that to what is being presented for next year? So the 296 would be compared back to the three. What was on the previous? Oh yes, yeah, yeah. Flip back to the next. Yeah, valid point. Yes, yeah, so it's on the 327. You are correct. I misspoke. That's a valid point. So it's the 327 for matching on the Blue Cross contract. So you flip to the other one. So at 290, so at, at so 327, you're picking up 32,000. So, so basically, it's a wash. Thirty thousand dollars for fifty thousand more in deductible. Right. So if you wanted to gamble, you could end up, let's just say you ended up with those two large claimants and $15,000 of additional exposure, you kind of come out about equal. That's right. Val, thank you for pointing that out. Next slide, please. Okay. So this is Transamerica. They're a third party that underwrites the stop loss. Um, not terribly dissimilar from what you have today. Uh, made some notes over there. What they have is what they call an aggregating specific, which all that basically means is Contract runs just like it's been running in the past. I believe that you guys have gone down the path of, of you know, um, getting yourselves educated a little bit on aggregating spec. But what, what that basically means is we're going to keep on paying. Uh, we're going to keep on paying for the claims above 150 until whether it's one claimant or 10 claimants, we pay an additional $65,000, and then the stop loss carrier kicks in. So that's it's a, just an extra layer of risk 
It's a little bit funky if you think about it that way. Um, the premiums associated with that are $272,000. And I think it's kind of an eye chart over there um, as far as how it's illustrated. But in essence, you've got an extra $65,000 with the claims exposure in addition to the premiums that you're paying. So it's the two seventy-two dollars plus the $65,000 is what's, is what's there. So it's a matter of whether you want to do reduce premiums on the front end but take on this exposure and if I told you that you have a couple of claimants, both of which are in ex you know, well in excess of the $150,000, you'll eat through that $65,000 pretty quickly. So this is almost a, a guaranteed cost. So you almost have to add the $65,000 to the premiums to get an apples to apples comparison. Next slide, please. So this is just an illustration of aggregating spec. Um, don't know if you guys have seen this before, but in essence, if you think in terms of how that works, you have an individual that generates $175,000 in claims under your current arrangement. You're responsible for the first one fifty. dollars The amount of, of reimbursement is $25,000. The second claimant, uh, but, but you, <coughs> excuse me. So you would normally get a reimbursement of $25,000, but because that $65,000 corridor exists, you get, you're going to keep on paying $25,000. A second claimant comes through at $180,000. It exceeds the 150 by $30,000. You have to keep on paying because of that $65,000 bucket, you've only paid $25,000 of it down. You now have to pay another $30,000 of that down. So now you've, you've, you've totaled at that point in time with the second claimant, you total $55,000 worth of eating into that aggregating spec. If a third claimant comes through who happens to be $200,000, um, the 150, normally stop loss would pay $50,000 in reimbursement. In this case, you still owe a little bit left on that 65, so you pay the first 10, and then stop loss kicks in and reimburses you the 40,000. If there was a claim at four through 10, or whatever the number might be, stop loss kicks in normal at that point in time. So it's just a way of kind of delaying the reimbursement. It's a lower premium on the front end, but you have to pay for it along the way. The gamble is, am I only going to have one claimant this year, or am I going to have 10 claimants this year? If, obviously, in this formula here, once you reach the third claimant, about partially into it, stop loss, stop loss starts kicking back in. So on that type of arrangement, if I had three high cost claimants, would would it, well, I guess you're showing three Watch. high cost claimants, would it? it so, so maybe to illustrate this a little bit differently, if this happened to be $500,000 claim, which is not unreasonable in today's terms, stop loss, or you'd be responsible historically for the first 150, stop loss would kick in the other 350, right? But because you have this aggregating spec that's there under that type of an arrangement, you would pay the first 65,000 of the 350 and then stop loss would kick in underneath that. So they would reimburse you $285,000. So, but, but then you've now satisfied that entire aggregating spec. So once the second claimant comes through, it'll just run normal, just like, just like your current contract is. It's just, you have to accumulate this, the aggregate number of claims in excess of the 150 that you have to keep paying until you reach 65,000. And then that's been set, and then that term of the contract has been satisfied. And then it rolls back into what you're, what you're familiar with. Okay. Any questions? Next slide. Okay. So this is taking a look at your 150 50 contract side by side in detail. Matter of fact, we flip to the next slide real quick. Okay, go back one, I'm sorry. Okay, so in here is taking a look at the Blue Cross Blue Shield, a couple of third party contracts, the 165 contract, and the Transamerica contract, kind of in a side by side basis. And this is a variance to budget. Budget, as we understand it, is right at what, 299, 300, something like that, right? So, so this is just that variance above that. There are some options at the end if you wanted to take on more risk. If you take, like, for instance, the very last option of Transamerica. It's $26,000 um, $26, to the good, but you're more than likely going to pay that extra $65,000 based upon your historical spend. And on average, you're probably going to have about one and a half or so large claimants per year. So you have to add that sixty-five dollars back in there. Um, on the Blue Cross Blue Shield, second from last, the one sixty-five. dollars so you're at $296,000. Um, again, you're taking on an extra $15,000 in risk. If you had one claimant, you would only add 15,000 to that number, and that's a better contract. Um, if you had two large claimants and you added $30,000 to that number, 
you're pretty close to this contract. And if you get to the third large claimant, this would have been a better contract. So that's the gamble on that Blue Cross 165 compared to the Blue Cross 150. And the other ones are just for illustration, which happen to be quite a bit more expensive. And I'll stop there for a second because I've thrown a lot at you in a very short period of time and answer any questions you may have about these illustrations so far. Okay, next slide. So from a continuity perspective, like a real-time you know, real reimbursement, um, right now you currently have a third-party stop-loss vendor. You know, again, claims or reports have to go to the third party. They have to validate them. They have to audit the claims. They have to make sure everything is kind of buttoned up. And yes, this is a real claim that needs to be reimbursed. There can be a delay in the reimbursements that come back to the city. Um, inside of a Blue Cross arrangement, uh, which, is the, which is the recommendation if you wanted to stay at the 150 level, um, it's a real-time benefit. So as soon as that claim hits 150, Blue Cross just starts paying. There's no, there's no delay in, you know, I paid this first and then seeking reimbursement on the back side. Um, there's no additional um, information needed. The quotes are firm and final. And, you know, even though it says they're good 120 days out, that's not necessarily relevant this year because your contract needs to go into effect here in the next few days. Um, but as you go into renewal cycles every year, both Transamerica and Blue Cross are two of a couple or just a handful of carriers that will lock in rates as early as 120 days out from your effective date. That's important for a city just because for budgetary purposes, it's nice to know what your stop loss is early. Typically, they're asking for claims data all the way up to the last 45 days or so, 30, 45, 60 days. Um, but in this case, these the quotes that we just illustrated on the last slide. If you want to go back to the one, you know, um, here, the Transamerica and the Blue Cross Blue Shield are both firm and final. So. And I believe, I don't know, Sonia, do you think it's at this point in time I'd just open up to questions or do you want to show that other Excel spreadsheet? What do you think? I go ahead and pull up the other spreadsheet. Yeah. Online. It shows, I think, the 24 quotes that we received. There you go. But you want to do the detailed one? Yeah. Okay. Is that two or three? Uh, your guess. It says three. Okay. If you could walk the commission through those and... I think that might be helpful too. Sure. Okay. So across the top, what you'll find is uh, the carrier. In this case, yeah, Partners Re is the Enforce. If you if you just visualize, if you scroll down the side, those are going to be the same columns. It's going to talk about your specific premium, your aggregate corridors, your total exposure. Um, that's inside of the contracts. We talk about 2412. I'll just point out a couple of differences. If we'll just focus on really rows 7 through thir 7 through 11, about where my hand is. If you'll scroll that way, you'll see that the 150 deductible will change. There's the 165 from Blue Cross Blue Shield that we illustrated. I'm going to keep scrolling across. You'll see that if you wanted to take on more risk and go into 175 or 150,000, we've got all these different carriers that quoted. Um, column L right there through the middle of the screen is the Transamerica. Um, quote, which had that aggregating specific, which is on row 11, which is highlighting the 65,000. If you keep scrolling that way, a number of other quotes from a number of other carriers um, that can be <coughs> all matching terms, 24 terms, <coughs> medical and pharmacy, asking for various levels of risk here. If you keep scrolling over just a little bit, I want to keep going. All right. You can see a couple of quotes from <coughs> Westport, which are columns X and Y. Um, you'll see that those changed the contract terms a little bit. They went to 1212s. I think if, if you looked at that detailed spreadsheet, you might say, well, here's a quote here that's $100,000 cheaper. Well, it's for an, what they call an immature contract at 1212. Claims that are incurred in 12 months and paid in 12 months. What that would mean for you if you're a 7-1 effective day is that if you entered into that contract, it'd be any claim incurred starting 7-1, so that's a great deal. But as you get into June of next year, and you're on June 20th, June 25th, you're getting close to the holiday, taking a vacation, and there's a claim that occurred. It not only is incurred, but has to be paid before the end of June in order to hit this contract. Well, if you think about how normal medical claims flow, as you go see, go have services rendered, there's a delay in billing, makes it to the carrier, it's processed. So there's always this delay, and that creates some exposure. So there's some cheaper premiums associated with that. In addition to that, um, you'll see that um, 
on at least a couple of, or at least one of the quotes there, they actually, in some of the cases, they'll increase your specific liability and otherwise. So um, not a contract that we would recommend for the city. It just leaves you exposed to claims that happen at the end of the year. So all sorts of various terms or, or various forms of contracts. If you'll scroll all the way back to the left-hand side, and we'll scroll down just a little bit. The other piece we don't want to lose sight of is your um, is your aggregate liability. So we focus a lot on the specific deductible, but the aggregate liability is important. And if you'll scroll down just a little bit here to this section right here. So there's a there's a column here called aggregate factors and then aggregate and then annual attachment factor. And what this basically means is this is 125% of what your expected claims are. If we were to take if we were to take the city's claims expected and just trend them forward to next year and say, what do we expect that to look like? And then I was buying a normal contract at 125%. What number could I expect? And that number should be in about the $5.2 million range is kind of how that works. Not that you would spend $5.2 million, but that that's when the contract would kick in. You can see that the Blue Cross Blue Shield quotes, which well, you can't really see the column headers, but really... Column D is that $150,000 specific deductible. Their number's coming in less than that by almost $100,000. So it's actually a pretty good contract. It's actually better than what we would have projected for you. And if you just scroll uh, to the right, focusing on really row 27 on the annual attachment, you'll see that the numbers will vary pretty dramatically. They go up to $5.3 million. Um, keep going over $5.4 million. $5.6 million on the far right hand side. So, so everyone focuses so much on the premiums and that specific deductible, but then you end up paying premium for this other coverage that just does, it's not as meaningful to the city. And so obviously the lower we can get that, that aggregate factor as well, and the lowest happen to be Blue Cross Blue Shield in this regard. If you wanted to go to the top, I'll just focus on two others as alternatives to our recommendation. And that is on Transamerica, if you'll scroll over to the right just a little bit. Keep going if you don't mind. Okay. So here we had a couple of Transamerica or uh, Transamerica quotes at the 150000 But just to the right of that, Transamerica, they have alternative quotes at $175,000 and $200,000. And if you'll scroll down to the bottom where the premium is, actually it's right here. Doesn't have, it doesn't have a header on the left-hand side, but these are what the premiums look like. And so you can see that you can drop the premiums fairly significantly. That column M drops to $223,000 if you're willing to take on an additional $25,000 per claim. Well, if I anticipate that you're going to have two claims, there's $50,000 you need to add to that number, so now you're sitting at $275,000. Not necessarily a bad contract if the city were willing to take on more risk. So. When we get, so as I went through the PowerPoint presentation, said matching what you have, probably Blue Cross Blue Shield is the, is the answer. If you're looking to up that liability and go to maybe 175 or 200, there are ways to lower your premiums, gamble a little bit without getting upside down. You would need to go to a third party like a Transamerica if the city were willing to take on that. Under that scenario I just gave you, if you had two large claimants and we ran normal, great. Um, I've got a customer right now that's a city that's been running on, on average, they're a little bit larger than you, but running on average between two and three large claimants a year. They had 21 this year. It just, the cost is increasing pretty dramatically. And so when you look at history, like, well, how did we run 10 years ago? It's, I hate to say it's irrelevant because it was real dollars spent and real risk that was transferred. But today's marketplace is just has these wild swings in what the cost of health care is. You can have a large claimant that's doing nothing but taking pharmacy medications. Like, how does that happen? That used to never happen before, but with the specialty medications and the injectables at $40,000 per, you know, and getting them twice a month, so $80,000 a month, now you're almost at a million dollars for the year. It's like, oh my gosh. But these are life-saving drugs. So they're great medications, but that's why we just caution in today's world about not carrying stop loss. But if you were willing to take on more risk, we did an actuarial evaluation for your group, and you are sizable enough that you could take on a little bit more risk. We would not suggest going all the way to 200 if that's where you wanted to go. It's a pretty big leap. Each claimant's another $50,000 in exposure. We would say probably need to increase that by about 25000 if that's where you wanted to go. Maybe, maybe baby step at the 60, 165. 
you know, because for, you know, to, as you pointed out, it's $15,000 per claim, which isn't too much. Um, if you had five claims, not the two or three we projected, not too much exposure there, maybe another thirty dollars or $45,000 worth of exposure. Um, but that pretty quickly starts making your math as it relates to the budget get upside down. So it's just a matter of about how predictable do you want that number versus how much relative. Questions? So on, I got a question for you. So on, so on the budget piece, so we're sitting at, I mean, we're basically targeting, what, 300000 299 um, And I understand that that's there. I mean, um, if you had a lower premium, let's just say you could save twenty, thirty, fifty thousand dollars $50,000 in premium, but, but there's the chance that you could go above that, what does that do from a city's perspective, I mean, from an overall budgetary perspective? I mean, does that, that feel comfortable? I mean, a lot of it depends on your reserve situation and other factors that go into that, but that, that really is the driver onto whether you take on more risk or you hold it. One, one is there some accounting standard that would require us to carry X part of that uh, aggregate specific on the books, or do you know? I, I don't think so. Are you aware of one, Aaron? No, I'm not. Okay. Uh, there's nothing that says you have to. I mean, we have cities that don't have reserves. I mean, right? I mean, if they have a large claim, they're pulling from general funds and they're doing things that are not healthy as a city, but I think that really becomes kind of how you operate internally. We would suggest that you carry reserves, right? Well, I think that the city, I mean, the reason we made the recommendation we did at 150 was really based on the level of risk. Um, there's nothing that keeps us, I think it's probably reasonable for us to look at a higher deductible if, if the commission's comfortable with that risk level. So it really comes down to what you guys would like, and we get to vote on it upstairs. You get to vote on it. Any other questions? David, what do you think? You were the well, I'm still not convinced we need it at all. You know, all we have is four-year data, which I would ask, why do we only have four-year data? We've been providing health insurance for 20 years to the employees, so why do we not know four? But even if you took just the four years, if we took this premium and put it in the reserves every year, the last four years, we'd be $175,000 ahead. If we did that for eight years, we're $350,000 ahead, and we've still paid all the claims. Granted, that's taking all of the risk, but historically, that's not been an issue. So I'm still not completely convinced that we need this at all in terms of, I mean, it is just a gamble. You're gonna buy option contract on all your stock market losses. You're gonna buy, I mean, you know, it's, it, it is. It's just a gamble one way or the other. Actually, go. There's a secondary tab. Can you go to the second tab. Of this? <coughs> there's another tab. Well, in this workbook, there's another tab at the bottom. If you maximize the workbook window, yeah. There you go. Okay, so this is just a quick history of where you've been. So, to your point, I mean, you could, you don't have to carry stop loss. I mean, it's, it's really so bad. there's the hundred seventy thousand dollar number I'm talking about. That we're actually ahead over four years. This year we went nineteen. Yeah. The other way. I mean, yeah, so that's yeah, the first year out of four. Yeah, so, so premiums are on that column. So over that period of time was eight hundred thousand. Reimbursements were six hundred and thirty-two. And to your point, it was a net one seventy to the good. Yeah. And we can certainly handle that out of any one of our. I mean, if it went the other way for a couple of years, then we might have to come back and and pick it back up. So I'm still wrestling in my mind. I guess I have to decide by the time we get upstairs whether we need this at all. I would, I I would say you'd be, be in this at some deductible level, but what is your recommendation? You deal with lots of companies. I'd say you'd be in the super, super minority and not carrying protection. When we have a we have a large corporate customer. I was just telling Sonia upstairs that um, just this last year has been uh, what they, they call it naked, but they have not carried stop loss protection in the industry, and they got hit with a payable, a payable fourteen million dollar claim that they negotiated down and settled at seven. Um, I've got a, I've got a more similar size, maybe twice the size of you. It's about a thousand employee lives um, in the DFW marketplace. Um, has got chose a year and a half ago to not carry stop loss. Um, they just got hit with their, uh, we call it again the five year flood. I'm using vernacular, but in essence, their claims experience has not been like it has been the last four years. Has not been favorable, and they're scrambling to go find a couple million dollars on a ten million dollar plan. 
it's not a scare tactic. It's just, but we also have other customers that if you look at their history, you could absolutely make an argument. Says, this one makes no sense. Why don't we just, we'll sock the money away, pay the claims as we go, and we should be good. And you can run an actuarial model that says, we probably can do that. As long as you can absorb the really big hits and sock enough money away to protect against that, we could help you set those numbers. It just puts you in a lot of peaks and valleys. It doesn't, it, it, it becomes harder from a budgetary perspective, you know, on an annual basis. I guess my biggest concern is my, and correct me if I'm wrong, but my understanding is that we have a slightly older workforce um, over the kind of general population, which has a tendency to create more expensive uh, claims on on average than the general workforce, and that we are that's not likely to change. In fact, it probably seems like it's going to go the wrong direction for us. Uh, and that health care costs are not going to go backwards. I mean, they're not going to go down anytime soon. So it seems like, yeah, over four years or some period of time, we might come out ahead. But one bad year could effectively set us back for 20 years of socked away money that, by the way, we haven't been doing. So maybe if we had started this discussion 20 years ago and been socking away sufficient funds, but but we are, uh, we are not, we haven't. And so we are, we don't know that this year won't be a bad year, but you know, within the, the downside risk of a, of a five or 10 large claim number without stop loss could really, really put a, a kink in our budget. And we can't afford it this year. I, I, I wouldn't have any problem with, you know, with increasing our risk, but I, I wouldn't want to do away with it altogether. I, I just think it would be too big a chance to take because, like the man says, you know, if you, if you see these re reports, you know, and what some of these medical bills are now, yeah, they're, they're astronomical. And uh, if you, you, you may, may be good, you know, you may never get one of those, but uh, the, the chance if you did, you'd be dead. What is the average deductible level for the companies that you guys um, consult for? So, so so the vast majority of our customers are self-funded. Um, to answer your question, is it's a, it's a function of how big you are and how much risk you take on. But basically, I'd say for a group of your size, you guys should be hovering in about the 170 to 175 range. I also have 3,000 life groups that are fully insured too, right? I mean, so it's, it's all about predictability and risk. So th there's no right or wrong answer, but I would say you guys could very comfortable, and I would stand here and feel very comfortable if you wanted to increase to 165 or 175, would not feel like that's taking on additional um, excess burden to the city. Would rather say, let's take a little bit of a gamble on the downside as far as lower premiums, um, thinking we should run maybe normal, uh, but knowing that there's there could be the potential of maybe we got that third or fourth claim that we didn't expect, but it's not it's not like having no insurance at all or no protection at all, I should say. Have you seen any of those flood years push a company into Chapter 11? Have not. Not as it or relates to... the city into Chapter 9? No? No, I have not. You know, these guys, I mean, the, re the reality of this is is that these guys and their actuary departments know exactly what the predictability is for this city, and they're telling us, based on that premium, that they're not expecting the five-year flood next year, or they would quadruple the premium. So the risk, really, of this being afraid because they're doing it based on all their companies and all their data that's how they set their premium this year ben they, they look at this and they they know what our claims are and so the probably the best predictor of what really is going to happen with our city employee pool is what they say the premium is but david that because they're basing it on a gazillion people but so that's not the way actuaries work actuaries don't work on me? what it's not the way it's not what next year is going You're to be. lecture me on insurance it's what I didn't realize you were an insurance salesman, but the, the point being that actuaries don't say this is what next year is going to be. It's what a next year may be. They don't know what next year, and what we're insuring isn't for what next year is statistically likely to be. We're insuring to prevent next year from being an outlier. That's what we're protecting ourselves against. We're not protecting ourselves from the average. We're protecting ourselves from the outliers. And so the actuary, you're right. That's Insurance what they're predicting. That's what they're predicting. Their rate based on but what anybody they can have good. but anybody can have an outlier. And my concern is the cost of that outlier is not something we can absorb in a in a one year budget. 
So, so to both of those points, actually, so you're right. They set the number based upon. They're going to they, make they money, know. right? <laughs> it would be five hundred thousand dollars next year if they really thought, based on their experience, that it was going to be. Right. And that's a where they number. they'll laser risk. And so, yeah, if you if you really think about the premiums you pay to a stop loss carrier, you know they need to you know they pay overheads and salaries yeah, and retirement yeah, yeah. funds. I mean, they got to make some money, right? So, so their target inside those 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 every everyone's a little bit differently, but different. But basically, their target ratio is about sixty five percent. They want to spend sixty five cents on every dollar to claims, and they want to keep the other thirty five cents. So that's the actuarial just underwriting. Anti ACA actually, it's fifteen eighty five, but well, that's on the medical side. But on stop loss, it's a lot. So, so, but to your point, stop loss is all about not your known risk, it's your unknown risk. Yeah. It's, it's the unpredictability. That's right. Well, I think a reasonable compromise is, is a higher deductible. I mean, I think we should take a little more risk in exchange for somewhat less premium. And it's, yeah, if they predict it right, it's going to balance out. That. Yeah, it's going to balance out for us. Well. We can afford a little more. Yeah, yeah. yeah absolutely. Uh, the, the last spreadsheet, the Excel like spreadsheet, if you don't mind. They jumped to 370000 but they didn't want to sell it. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> if I had, if I had my computer up, I'd I don't like the tiered aggregate. If you'll scroll that. across to the Trans America coil, well, it's, it's sixty-five thousand. It's a little bit too far. <laughs> There's two white columns. There we go. So the one seventy-five is going to be column M. Maybe if you can just click on the header of M, so we're focused there, and then scroll down. Okay. So if you look at the premiums here, that's at two twenty-three. I think actuarially you're going to run another, you know, one and a half to two more claims. So what you've done by doing that is you picked up an extra twenty-five thousand dollars or twenty-five thousand dollars per claimant, so an extra fifty thousand dollars or so. So from a budgetary perspective, I would say, you know, two twenty-three plus fifty is going to get you close to two seventy-five, two seventy-three, right? And, and that's what you'd spend. Period. There's no, there's no aggregating specific. It's not, now if you end up getting three or four. Then the numbers start going north of that three hundred twenty-seven thousand dollars number that we proposed at the one hundred and fifty. So that's not a bad gamble. Yeah. There, you know what I'm saying? I mean, because but you're telling us that statistically we should have one and a half to two. Right. So this would allow us to have four without having any. For, but before you go above the new quote, right? That's exactly right. I got a quote. Does a different insurance companies one better than the other? Yeah. Well, yes. I mean, I'm sure. I mean, I, you know, beauty's in the eye of the beholder, right? Um, you start out with financial stability. Right? I mean, the the biggest problem you could have is if a claim gets incurred and you file it, and nobody's there to pay it. That's a bad problem. <laughs> right? So, so as long as we we make sure that they're all A rated, we can't suggest anybody other than that, I mean anybody other than that. Um, it, the answer is yes. Some are very timely in their payments. Was this others, Trans Transamerica? Company. So, so Transamerica has already agreed in advance that they will take any of the claims that are paid by Blue Cross and in what, what we'll call good faith. It just says we're not going to review them to say was this necessary or not. If they pay it, we agree with it, we reimburse it. So they've already agreed to that in advance. So yes, they are in that regard good. And they're still going to exist in six months. They've been around a long time. If you wanted to look at the 200, which I don't suggest because I think it's a pretty big leap for you guys. Um, oh, you were, it was right next to the column you highlighted. I'm sorry. I should have just stayed put. Right there. It's this column in if you highlight that one. So here you can drop your premium by an extra 50000 bucks, but you're picking up $50,000 in risk per claim. So take the two claims at $50,000 a piece, so you add 100 to that. So now you're at 282000 but for each one, then you have you're taking on a heck of a lot more exposure. So, that column M at the 175 would be more comfortable if and more consistent with where you've been historically. I'm good with that one. You guys are. I'm mistaken. 175 or two. 175. So now I will point out one one piece. I'm sorry before we get too far. This last number here. Remember I told you about 5.2 million was the number. Mm -hmm. Blue Cross was at about five one. They are at. Five six, almost well, five six and a half. Chances of you getting there are very small. Can you get there? Yes. I mean, some employers do, but there is an. I just want to point out there is an additional two hundred thousand dollars or so. Well, compared to Blue Cross, it's an extra almost five hundred thousand. But there's a couple of hundred thousand dollars worth of additional exposure in that aggregate piece of it. So I just want to make sure I was putting that on the table for you. You guys move forward. 
sounds, and that doesn't concern me nearly as much. Sounds good, Jared. Uh, we probably need to get on the special events unless there's any other questions about this. Yeah, we do. If we're going to touch on that item, we're not going to have time if we don't. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. That brings us to item four, discuss the special events ordinance. And I think every one of them has got a copy of that ordinance uh, attached to our agenda. Well, yeah, and I want to say something just quickly, and I'm sure Commissioner Wilson does too. I, this has been a long time coming, and I'm sure Commissioner Wilson will tell you more about that. But I feel pretty good about the work we've done. Um, Commissioner Wilson was involved, Kelly Tompkins was involved, Marcy Jarrett was involved, along with city staff to include the police department, and Will and Andrea. And so we think we've come up with a pretty good version, mm -hmm. and Will can step us through it. And Commissioner Wilson, if you'd like to add any points along the way, please do. I was just going to say, after probably seven or eight years, which is longer than I've been on the commission, I'm finally pretty happy with it. That, that's good enough for me. You're happy. Yeah. yeah, yeah. <laughs> oh, sure, yes. <laughs> that's on and TV. And not just me, but Kelly. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, your job just got a lot easier. Yeah. <laughs> Is it my turn? I'm on. You're on. Okay. Uh, good evening, Commissioners. My name is William Gill. I'm the Assistant City Attorney. I've been given the opportunity to discuss with you and present to you the recommended changes to the special event ordinance. Uh, the city manager touched on all the different individuals and departments that were involved in the project. And I don't want to forget about Public Works and Parks and Recreation who put in a lot of work, including revising the special ordinance permit and application form. Uh, I'd like to start off overall with the goal of the project, which was to improve the ordinance and bring and allow, or sorry, to improve the ordinance and bring a better quality of life both to the citizens of Enid and to make Enid an easier and better model to bring events into. To do this, all the different departments had to go through several iterations of the ordinance, several revisions, and the goal was to simplify the process and remove tasks that would that are re remove items that might hamper special events in the community or coming to Enid. Some of the different things uh, after the revisions were completed uh, included clarifying the definitions, creating a more positive intent and purpose statement, reducing the special event uh, application permit time from 60 days to 30 days, removing needless fees for the operators, requiring an insurance certificate when the application is presented, and then making sure staff is uh, informed about where those individuals, when they're asking for that insurance permit, where the, the different items and places and businesses they can go to go get that. Um, we also went to simplify the notice requirements so that operators are involved with the city, so the city can put it on the calendar and notify and help notify all the different people who might be affected by the event. Uh, requiring a list of vendors selling alcoholic beverages and making sure they have the proper permits from both the city of Enid, the county, and the ABLE Commission. Uh, also requiring operators to speak to the police department to make sure they have the proper security for the event. Uh, one of the other things we added that wasn't in the previous ordinance is to make sure that there is a, a legal, or there's a review by the legal department for ADA to make sure that all of our citizens can attend these events. We also looked at not requiring uh, food or vendor fees if they're uh, no, no food or vendor fees if they are already a commercial mobile food vendor because they've already received the permit and so not charging them again to be a mobile food vendor. Uh, removing the vendor permit process and then making sure that operators have illumination, trash receptacles, that they're responsible for cleanup, uh, public toilets accessible for ADA individuals, and a adequate first aid for the events that the operators are going to run. Finally, the last section is allowing the city manager to waive uh, some or all of the fines or, or some or all of the fees uh, for if there's special economic development or if the, uh, if the operators aren't charging a vendor uh, participation or entry fee. Do you have any questions? Actually, the only question I've got is, it, Who's going to enforce this ordinance? I mean, we've, we, we've had issues along this line for a long time. And, and let's, let's say that you just go down to the park and you realize there's a big event going on. There's a bunch of people down there and things are happening and, and, and they don't have any permit. Um, well, it depends on what, what it is, Commissioner. We're not going to be looking to 
go up to every gathering at the park and say, hey, do you have your special event permit? But if we know that something is happening that is against the ordinance, it's going to be incumbent on somebody, either from the parks department, the code department, um, myself, a commissioner, somebody to tell them, you know, that they're in violation of the ordinance and encourage them to get into compliance. That's, that's the approach that we'll take it with. There's a lot of the unnecessary regulation I think we took out of it, which removed some of that. Do you want to talk to some of that piece about, I mean, the, like notifying Well, people? I just was going to say, um, as far as the enforcement of it, I know that I've had or been involved in some things where we've had the police come up and say, do you have a permit for, you know, can I, and I've had to go get my permit and show that show it to them to make sure, you know, that they can look at it and make sure we're doing everything we're supposed to. So. I don't know how many other people they've done that to, but I know they've <clears throat> they've come up to the Flink of the Springs before and asked to see my permit. So I think that they do. And when you're doing all of this, the Parks Department and everybody that we that at the city, uh, they're pretty on top of making sure you do everything right. <laughs> so. Well, you, the only thing I'm thinking about is I, I can remember sometimes in the past that there'd be uh, political rallies or things like that that would take place in, in a public park or public place. That would, I, I, I don't know who organized them, but it always seems like the city never had any knowledge that they were taking place. Oh, I don't know. I, I know, like, last week, whenever <clears throat> there were people that wanted to gather on the courthouse lawn, which is not city property, it's county property, but they wanted to do a walk for the Orlando shooting that happened last right. week. They made sure they contacted the city and asked, where can we park, where can we walk, what can we do? I think most people are pretty good about about doing that. Um, I mean, there's probably people that don't think about it just because they don't know, but I think most people are pretty good about trying to contact the city and make sure they do it right. But, but it's your understanding that probably the police department would be the one that's who normal. has done that's well, I mean, on top of just you know, city staff in general, whenever we're trying to do something, they make sure to tell me, you know, on, in my experience, if I'm doing something wrong. Um, <laughs> um, well, and I know, and like with Kelly, I know with First Friday, she's had, you know, I know the police have come up to her and said, hey, you know, we need to adjust how we're doing this here or whatever, you know, with different people in different areas downtown. Um, so in my experience, it's been, yeah, the police, have, they've always been friendly and they've always been kind about it, but they've always made sure, I guess for the filling at the Springs, I think somebody called about the noise from the fireworks. And so they came down to see what we were doing and they wanted to make sure we had a permit for it. And we did. And they said, okay, you're good. Went on about their way, and I know with Kelly, I know that you know they they made the whatever proper adjustments had to be made, and they were fine. And so, and and I think in our experience so far, it's been the police department that we've dealt with. I, but they're the ones that are out on the street to see it yeah, anyway. In, in, re in reading through the ordinance, it, it looked a little vague to me as to at what point it would become an, an event that would require a permit. Well, I think it's any time it's on city property or impact city property is what it is. So. If you're doing something like on private property, then you don't have to do that. But if it's on city property or affects city property, you have to have an event permit. Too. But I'm talking about something like a family reunion or something that's taking place at the park. No. Uh, family reunion, we would just require them to rent a park pavilion if that's what they're going to use. There's no requirement because that's a family reunion is not open to the public. If, Dan, if you well, scroll this up just to has the, to be open to the public. Right. I think that's our definition at the top. If you can okay. scroll up to definitions, that makes sense. It excludes lemonade stands. You just scroll down. I, I, saw, I saw where lemonade stands were excluded. specifically excluded. Uh, and bake sales. That was, that that was for two years ago. Bake sales and lemonade stands. Yeah, right there's the definition. Outdoor meetings, festivals, gatherings, amusement show, concert, or other activity open to the public and is on or affects city property like the commissioner okay. said. Any more questions? job will <laughs> uh, we'll uh, adjourn and uh, reconvene upstairs in uh, about 20 minutes a little over. thank you for joining us for the Enid City Commission study session if you have any questions or comments, visit our website at ena.org.